Welcome again to our late August, almost September, if you can believe it, um, edition of Glacier Conversations. I am Amy Lucky, and I have the privilege of coordinating uh, the Glacier Conversation virtual uh, series here at the Conservancy. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, Andrew Smith, Sean O'Leary, and Stacy Dubuque. Um, for those of you who attend these often, uh, you'll notice that we are not joined by Conservancy Executive Director Doug Mitchell. Um, I gave him the night off tonight, so no worries. He will be back for book club next month. Um, September 20th is, is our next <laughs> virtual event. Um, however, I am joined by a real expert in the field of search and rescue at Glacier National Park. Um, Chief Ranger Paul Austin is here with us, and when I called Paul, to ask him if he would if he would um, be gracious enough to do one of these for us, he sort of uh, I think threw like a dart at at the calendar in August because uh, I don't know that he does much pre planning in his job. So thank you so much, Paul, for um, taking time out of your I'm sure always busy schedule. Absolutely, um, good to be here. Awesome. Um, Paul does have a presentation for us, and we'll get to that and all of your questions in just a minute. Uh, but to get us started, Paul, can you share a little bit about uh, sort of your history, how you got to Glacier, uh, how long you've been here, and maybe what a little bit about what your huge job, I'm sure, entails? Sure. Um, so yeah, in terms of finding the date, it was a dart, um, not knowing when we would be have the, have the time or the space. Um, and interestingly, with this storm coming in, although one side of my of, of our shop is wildland the wildland fire group um, within within the park. Great for that the rain. Um, uh, we're also been incredibly active with the topic we're talking about today. Um, so with search and rescue. So we've had about thirty uh, searchers out in the field um, most of the day today, um, working a couple of different rescues. And so I won't go into crazy detail on those, but the timing is spot on. Um, so do you want me to um, jump onto my slide and then go from there? Or do you want me to just do a quick intro of me and then we can go back and forth a little bit and then go? If you want to jump into your presentation, maybe some of that info is is in your presentation as okay. well. Um, your history, it's up to you. Sure, I can go that way. Let me share my screen then and bear with me, Amy, while I get there. Absolutely. And if you just let me know when when we're good. I think it looks great. Okay. So yes, yeah, so I, it's, it's fun to see a bunch of names that I recognize on the list. So uh, good evening to a lot of you. Happy end of August. Um, and first up, um, just a, a food for thought. I got a couple photos up there from last Saturday. And um, as a as a conversation piece to get us going, once I finish the the presentation or the overview, really, it's just, it's just a question of, uh, yeah, where is it and have you been there? Um, and then we'll, I can we use that as a little transition to talk a little more about um, a conversation I had with my 14 year old there in the picture. Um, as we, as we talk about climbing and being in the amazing place of Glacier. So let's see, first off about me um, and, and how did I get here? I, uh, incredibly fortunate that, um, to be here in Glacier National Park, uh, it's one of those places that's that's amazing and a connection. Uh, Glacier is where I first had my start in the National Park Service, working in Belly River back a few years ago in 1995. But I've been involved in search and rescue from before then. Um, growing up, I was part of an explorer search and rescue post um, in high school, in fact, and was actually a uh, one of those kids in in the late 80s uh, who carried a pager around and got called out of math class to go uh, go on rescues. So it was one of those schools. I'm like, wait, I can get called out of class to go be in the woods. That sounds good and help people. Um, and so that's what really got me got me started into it. And from there, I've been incredibly fortunate. I've been worked here in Glacier um, in the 90s. Also had an opportunity, went to Rocky Mountain National Park uh, where I got really into technical rope rescue. Um, then on to Yosemite where that continued as well as getting into to helicopter uh, work in search and rescue, uh, then on the Grand Canyon, uh, where naturally is a bit more swift water, um, as well as canyons and Jesus helicopter work. Christ. And then moving down um, into Saguaro National Park down in Arizona, and then coming back up here nine years ago. And so in terms of, I've had a, a remarkable opportunity to, to do what I love, which is protecting our, our public lands, while also protecting the people that, that come therein. 
So I, I do feel incredibly lucky and search and rescue is just one of those many portfolios within uh, the chief ranger's office in terms of the way, or the way a park is set up. And yeah, it's one of the many hats, but it's one of the amazing places where you can make a, a, an amazing difference uh, to whether it's an affecting a rescue, um, like we were uh, fortunate enough earlier today to be able to connect a, a, a kid who was out all last night um, in the nasty storms and everything else, but make connections and be able to get him through a lot of his tenacity, but help help him uh, along with our teams out there, get him uh, back to his family to uh, being able to do get people out of hard, difficult places uh, to doing really difficult things like recovering the bodies of a deceased family member um, and the importance of that to be able to provide closure uh, to family um, so they know and also the challenges when we don't find somebody um, and knowing what that what that's like and what it goes through for all of us. So it's an amazing discipline that's brought highs and lows, um, but hopefully I can ex just talk a little bit through today about Glacier um, as we go on about what things what things have happened here. Um, and then also some of the challenges and some of the things that I've seen over my uh, 20, what, 20, who's doing the math there, but 28 years um, in, in the National Park Service, not only talking about Glacier, but our users as a whole. So is that, Amy, anything else? Get going? All right, so um, so with that, uh, search and rescue in Glacier, um, what we'll talk about is I think there's important pieces to, to jump into. Number one is some, an interesting thing about our policy that I'm guided that goes, I think it's it's a, it's a taking a, a many steps back, but understand kind of what the direction is that I have um, from the National Park Service and what we do in terms of rescue. Some of the complexities, just talking through and pointing out some of the, the many different search and rescue, and I won't even cover them all, but just just the the big general areas. Uh, then some trends, and so what I mean, some trends of visitation, um, both EMS and search and rescue calls, and I think many on this call know the visitation piece and how that plays. But then what are we seeing with those calls? And talk a little bit about some of the things that may be influencing it. Um, uh, maybe some staffing piece, and then what are we doing about it? And so, how do we actually get how do we actually get it done? Because um, it's pretty when you think about our million acres, our unbelievable complexities here. Uh, we still and have a great tradition here um, in Glacier for a very long time of of taking care of folks, and then uh, then really open it up uh, to what we want to do with questions and otherwise. Um, so with that, I won't go way in. I know we probably have a couple policy um, lovers in there or policy wonks, whatever we want to go with. And, and that's a piece of just understanding uh, management policies, policies for the National Park Service. So number one, man the saving of human life takes precedence um, over other management actions. The reason I bring that up is I've, I've actually had people come up to me and uh, in, in the public and otherwise and say, I can't believe you won't fly a helicopter to save a life. That is false. We absolutely do fly helicopters in wilderness to save lives. Um, so when we think about different things that we're here to manage, we absolutely. Um, so looking for uh, protecting human life, um, really, if we can provide injury-free visits, yes, but that takes precedence over everything else. That being said, there's an interesting, a really another important piece um, of policy for us, and that's for search and rescue. And the guidance that we have for search and rescue is different than a sheriff gets, for example. Um, the protection for and safety of park visitors, the service makes reasonable efforts. And so what's really interesting for us is that search and rescue is a discretionary function uh, that we have court cases that back up, but it says that when everything is going completely sideways, um, I don't have need to put my rescuers, our rescuers, um, yes, we'll put them in harm's way. That's part of, partially what we sign up for, but there, there's a limit to it. And so there's a, it's a discretionary a function in terms of what we do. Um, sometimes this is a hard thing to, for folks to understand, um, but the, the piece is that my, my number one is I've got to make sure we're taking care of our rescuers that are out there. Um, it's it's our profession. It's the emergency of the, the person who is out there missing, hurt, or otherwise, uh, but that's the piece. We needed them all coming back whole um, at the end of the day. So enough about policy. Let's get into like what are the things that we deal with um, in terms of here at Glacier, and it's just What's amazing about Glacier is the complexity. And so, and the range of disciplines that we have. So whether it's, if you've been on the trail on a hot summer day, um, and we seem to have a lot more of those, um, if you've been out by the loop, you likely have seen us. Um, and you've seen us dealing with heat related 
issues with folks um, on the loop. So trail medicals, we do a ton of those. Um, then we also do get into some of the technicals and so technical alpine uh, where folks get cliffed out or have it get into trouble. But let's not forget about our waters and our amazing wild, wild and scenic rivers, um, as well as creeks. We know that things, unfortunate things happen, whether it's an avalanche gorge or otherwise, um, that that's another piece of the disciplines that we're, we're part of. Um, helicopter work, you know, we'll talk a little more um, about the great resource we have with Two Bear and, and our history with, with Minuteman Aviation, which has done amazing things uh, for our visitors and for our locals here in the community. But it's it's broad when you start thinking about it. some of these other parks I've talked about um, where I had to ex kind of experience. We often would have more of a focus versus here. It just keeps going um, because that's not all. Um, you think about other things that we do. Um, we've got this thing called winter. Um, and when we think about whether it's avalanches, whether we um, in terms of rescues, um, and then, yeah, we have snow machines, snow sleds, whatever your, way you want to talk about it, is that while you cannot ride a snowmobile in Glacier National Park, we work with our partners, work on our boundaries, uh, but then we also will occasionally use either ours or work with cooperators to gain access for a rescue. So remember, we the human saving of human lives is precedent. So even though it may say, we may, I may say, yeah, the public can't ride a snowmobile, uh, we may use that to access to save a life and, and to help someone. Um, of course, technical rope rescue, that happens. And then large scale searches. Uh, many of you have probably seen over the years when we have a missing person and well, <clears throat> whether it's, you'll see search flyers out there. We use a lot of different, um, whether it's social media or otherwise, um, interviewing hikers on the trails, but the range of disciplines and what we're dealing with is huge. And then I might put a whole separate category in here. And that's this thing that we do here in Glacier on the Go to the Sun Road. Uh, it seems like even more so this year of road-based rescues. Um, I don't know. I think we've had three or four cars go off the road this year. Um, and it's been very, very positive outcomes on most aspects. But it's still, we still got to work on getting not only the people up um, and the vehicles back out. And you'll see when we do those sort of things, it, it turns into more, I'd almost call it an industrial rescue in terms of, uh, what we're working with and working with our, our local volunteer fire departments and otherwise to, to help. So with that, um, visitation. You might have heard, um, we've become popular. And so what used to be uh, about a million and a half uh, 20 years ago to come on over 3 million, it's remarkable. And what's remarkable about the visitation, I think I'm probably speaking to the choir here, but I always I always like to refresh folks that to help people understand is that parks like Rocky Mountain National Park or Zion, amazing. Their overall visitation is higher than ours. However, our monthly visitation in July and August is higher. And so the complexity of what we have um, and the busy, busy months is that we have the busiest months of the National Park Service. And that's amazing of how concentrated our visitation is and what that means and what that does. Um, in actually in July of 17, um, we actually were the first park, uh, major park, including Yellowstone to go over a million visitors in one month. Um, and you think about us in tiny Northwest Montana, um, there's a huge, uh, there's a huge impact with that. And so with this increased visitation over the years, um, so with it, increased visitation, what about EMS? So calls for service, emergency medical services. You look back just 10 years um, and looking at our, at, our, at our stats of where we are for calls for service, um, going from 100 to pushing over 300, nearly 300. And so you look at the calls for service that we're having for, for help. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Um, but one of those big reasons is the chart we just looked at before. Our visitation is going way up, but you notice our calls for service and for serious incidents is going up at a higher rate. Um, if you were to start transposing the, the numbers over, it's we're getting a higher calls for number of calls for service. And I'll touch into this a little bit, and I'm sure you guys have some ideas as well. And so EMS, emergency medical calls. And so this could be on the road if someone having a Maybe it's a heart attack, maybe it's a CPR, maybe it's I fell and twisted my ankle, uh, but not only on the road, but also on the trails. And so when we go into SAR, so search and rescue, the acronym we use for that. Um, similarly, uh, if you start looking at the 
at the trend, um, we're clearly moving on our way up. Uh, last year, excuse me, last year, about 124, I think is the number that my dispatch uh, provided us of, of calls that we went on. And that means, yeah, we're responding up the trail. We're doing a search. We're calling a cooperator in to help us. Um, and a couple of these, these peaks on here, I think are important to point out. Uh, 2016, uh, a um, an interesting advertising campaign for those of us working for the Park Service. Um, many called it Find Your Park. Many of us called Find Another Park um, just for how uh, how visitation was coming in. And we all saw the spike that came with it. Uh, of course, 2020, we see it with, with COVID, but then the numbers just keep going up for search and rescue. Um, and interestingly, just what are what are the calls for service that go in there? Well, one of the biggest ones that's gone up recently is heat related calls. Um, and we look at those of you who live in the Flathead or in Glacier County and this up in Northwest Montana, and we look at what is what are the weather patterns been and what's been happening and whether it's those those watching the rivers this year and how quickly they dropped uh, with an early melt and those hot high high temperatures. Um, and what that does. Uh, and also just think about the trails, like where the trails uh, no longer have shade. And so one of the issues that we have on the Highland Trail and then the trail dropping down from granite to the loop is there is not a lot of shade for folks at the end of their day um, as they're trying to get themselves out. Um, so definitely some significant challenges. So the the question that I get asked a lot is like, what's happened? Um, is it is there truly a change in our in our visitor? When we look at these numbers, is there a, a reliance? And and this is my perspective. So this is not an official government um, document that goes out there. This is Paul's perspective is that, yes, um, it does appear that our visitors are less prepared than they were in the past. And what, what do I, what do I, why do I say that? Um, I think we can point at many things. Uh, it used to be a lot harder, quite frankly, to get to Glacier. Um, you really had to trip plan to trip plan to get to Glacier. Um, I mean, I grew up, my my mom and my grandfather worked worked in many. And so Glacier was a place that my family would come and, and, and we would drive and it would take time. Um, and so I think a number of our visitors, clearly it's a much easier to get here um, where you don't have to do as much homework. And when you would come here, um, you would actually, I, in, in my perspective, do a lot more homework. Um, in terms of figuring out where to go. You'd go to a visitor center, you'd ask questions. Uh, yes, you would read Gordon Edwards' climbing book um, about what where you're gonna climb and where you're gonna go. Uh, but the trip planning piece uh, was, I feel is much more, and, and this is partially doing interviews as well, is much more superficial now. It's, hey, there's a really cool picture. And I won't point everything at social media, but I do believe that plays a role in our society today in terms of, wow, this is great picture. I wanna go have this picture. I mean, look at a number of you and your backdrops of your of your your photos. Um, and when you're on screen, even on Zoom right now, you've got cool photos of Glacier, right? And so people are like, wow, I want I want to experience that. Now, when we moved back here nine years ago, my wife and, and two boys, uh, I think the first the first year we might have posted a couple trips and we had friends come back and just say, I want I want this. I, I want to have this experience. And so when we think about where what's sending some people to certain places. Um, they're looking for that where to go to, but not necessarily the things that maybe experienced back at your users are thinking about, um, about whether it's the trip planning piece. And we'll talk about how to recreate responsibly. It definitely is changing. A couple other things that I think are worth talking about and mentioning is yes, visitation, but also what's that put, how's that pushing visit, pushing the daily use? Um, in terms of, yeah, you used to be able to come in the park whenever you wanted to without a reservation. Now that um, between six and three, you need a reservation, there's definitely a push, which is expected uh, in the evening. And, and what is that doing? And is that causing some folks to make different decisions and choices? Perhaps. Um, so there's some other pressures that are out there. And then also the, the fall and spring, it's a longer season, um, which is also causing some changes. And so there's thrown out there. There is there's a shift, and so what's my responsibility? Our responsibility is to figure out how do we communicate, how do we educate, um, how do we continue to 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 work with work with our visitor who's coming here now. Um, a couple other things, just I think that are that are impactful and, and positive can be positive here as well, and that's technology. And so thinking about technology and during my career is like yeah, I've been uh, around when we carried monster radios to smaller radios to when what were they um, not 
sponsoring any of these devices, of course, but uh, like the first dev satellite devices that came out were one way. You would have your device and you would press a button that said, I need help. Uh, I was working at the Grand Canyon at the time when some of these first ones started coming out and it's uh tells you where it is and it just says 911. And so we launched a helicopter to this remote location uh, to land, find these folks and, and they're on a route, not a trail. And the first time they, they hit the button, they were concerned that they were off trail. Well, there was not a trail, it was a route they were following. And so we assured that them they were on, on route and it was still technical, but they were still and so are you requesting an evacuation or help or anything else? No, nope, we just want to make sure we're on the right route. The next day, we got another 911 button from them. We fly in. They're concerned because they couldn't find or didn't know if this was the right water source. You're in the desert. And so finding your right water. But once again, we're risking lives, flying a helicopter to someone who's pressed a 911 button. Um, so I can't remember if it was that point or the third, I can't remember if the second time or the third time we actually decided it was time for them to load them the helicopter and it was time for them to come out and uh, they were actually cited uh, for causing a hazardous situation. And so there's a, a piece of it of like this, this reliance and is there actually, um, or does, is decision-making changing? And so some of this can ask yourself this, if you carry a device like this, and I do, um, is it changing your decision-making because you think you can make a call? Um, and so are we less prepared thinking that we don't have to be self-reliant, um, that we can use a satellite device to come get help and come we'll get help. Um, I think that is that is changing some things, but I will say it's also amazing. Um, without question, the especially now that we're gotten much more into two-way communication devices, which means I can press help, um, but then the other agency, whoever gets that, can actually respond and ask you questions and you can clarify. And so it could be a case of like, no, nah, just tell my wife that I'm going to be a day late. I'm just spending, I'm just, and ideally you've actually got it set up. So you're telling your wife that or your spouse or your loved one. Um, or it could be a case of, you know what? I've just twisted my ankle. I think if I could get a horse, um, I think I could ride out. And so we're able to make some of these risk management decisions, which put a lot lower level of risk, still get people to a higher level of care. Um, and so it's a, a piece of recognizing that some of this technology without question, um, has helped and, and, and saved lives as we go on through. Actually, another interesting thing with technology recently, and I'll just uh, something that's, that's hitting us right now is I am not the biggest technology guy, but I do carry uh, an iPhone. And some of you with new iPhones, and I don't know which number it is, but there's a new feature on your iPhone, which detects crashes. And so with that, um, if you drop your phone, your iPhone thinks it's been in a crash and actually notifies uh, a 911 center. And we then up spending all this time going back and forth between iPhone and um, the dispatch, our dispatch to try to figure out if there's an incident or not. Well, I think a lot of you know, Glacier doesn't have cell phone coverage in most of the wilderness. And so if you drop your phone and spend, and you drop your phone coming down the highway two corridor, driving uh, towards Kalispell, your cell phone suddenly gets coverage when it comes into West Glacier. And so I think we've had at least 10 calls of 911 calls from iPhones that were working with volunteer fire departments and otherwise to try to figure out if there's actually a crash um, or if someone's just dropped their iPhone and because we can't tell the difference when we're responding. And so technology hits us in different ways. That's something that needs to be figured out. It could be great um, for many people. Uh, but also for us, as we're trying to figure out if there actually is a call and like putting rescuers in harm's way, kind of what is that technology doing um, and what are those impacts? Um, how about uh, this one? Let me play a, this video and kind of remind kind of how it, how it relates to technology. So going to Sun Road, uh, springtime. Super popular pastime, um, and rightfully so. I'm a. I love to uh, to ride the road, and I've seen a number of you of faces and names that I recognize on here. Um, <clears throat> triple arches. You'll see. What do we have right over here? Is a couple cyclists, um, and so decision making. And most of us, when we ride up a road and we come to an app, I shouldn't say most of us. That's not fair. Um, my choice when I cut ride up a road and I see an avalanche path with snow coming across the road, 
I'm like, huh, I think I probably should turn around here and not cross this because this means there's unstable snow above. Um, I don't know if this will come again and if I could get swept away or otherwise. Um, and when you look at triple arches, pretty amazing location. But as you look, and I think this shot scans down here in a minute um, and reminds us that's a pretty long way to the bottom. Um, and what the potential there is. But with visitors going across, we then needed to rescue them to get them back while not risking our rescuers. And so our, our rangers and our avalanche forecasters. And so holding them up um, and then waiting until the snow stabilizes at night and then bringing them back across. And so part of it, sometimes my job um, is to adjust and figure out as, as a park. And we look at it, it's like, man, what's happening? And why are there so many people? Well, the big thing for technology wise is e-bikes um, in terms of what's really influenced and had so many more people go up the road who maybe aren't making the, those same sort of decisions um, and decision-making process that's up there that people were just like, I'm renting this e-bike. I'm going to take it to the top because um, that's what, that's what the story is. That's what everyone tells me I need to do. And so we've had to change some of our, our management of saying, you know what, no, there's a, there's a high point. Um, there's a high point on the road um, to keep everyone from riding on and riding through these. Cause this was, this has happened multiple times to a point where I was like, okay, we need to make a change, but it's another technology on one side. It's pretty amazing um, to see folks up there that um, are having that experience in a safe area and without cars on the road, which is how a great way to experience on a bike to, to experience the road and look around and, and really, just how majestic Glacier National Park is. Uh, that being said, um, the technology with the e-bikes is allowing folks to get up to an area that they're not really aware, despite all the signs that we put up um, of the hazards that's presented where they're at. So, um, so with all that, uh, a big question is like, man, okay, there's a bunch of things going on. What are we doing? Um, we've got challenges here, uh, here in Glacier without question. We don't have the time that we had 20 years ago to train because I already mentioned we're so much busier than we were um, in the past. And we don't have the numbers of staff that we have had before. Another huge challenge we have in Glacier is we're not central. I, we don't have a central place that everything doesn't funnel through West Glacier. Uh, we actually have almost five different areas that we need to set up. To set up a ranger and a, a someone to re, who's all fully trained, um, eight to $10,000 when you really think about it with ski equipment, dry suits, surgical equipment, communication gear. Um, it takes it takes financial resources as well. And so it's hard. Um, and, and, how do, and how do we do it? Well, we do it through a bunch of different ways. And so number one, we do it through the Conservancy. And so the Conservancy has been great to support a pretty remarkable program I'll talk about later, um, which is our preventative search and rescue program. Um, and as well as the ability to help with some of the equipment and some of these donation pieces. But the big piece here of how we address search and rescue and go get it is really with our partners. Um, and that's the big piece to take home. And the, I alluded to it earlier, but one of our biggest resources and assets we have here uh, in Northwest Montana, and it really it spreads farther than that. And so the, the response area of Two Bear Air, which is supported by our, our local philanthropist, um, and Flathead County, it's it's remarkable. And so if those of you don't know, Two Bear Air is fully paid for uh, by Mr. Gogan, and it's um, he pays for everything. It's very un it's it's very unusual to normally uh, public agencies and otherwise we have to fund and charge and do all these other pieces and things, um, including training. And with Two Bear, we have a really highly functioning team, um, well trained. Um, and they do respond. And what's their, their really, it's an amazing, um, when you think about the ultimate mission, it's the ultimate mission is saving lives. And I'll say without question that they have saved lives here in Glacier um, because of the resource and the ability to get people to a higher level of care and put a much lower risk uh, to to our employees and rescuers that are out there. They were up trying to get in today uh, with us, despite the weather and everything else. But there are days that you just can't. Um, and today was one of those days up to this point of being able to get in. Um, so they've done, we have a great relationship, very, very fortunate. And I'll say that the relationships just in general um, up here in Northwest Montana are fantastic with all of us in, in public service, which as a testimony to, we're all here for a very similar reason. Um, and we really are supportive of each other. In terms of 
this two, uh, to, to two bear resource, they just can do some things that are pretty remarkable. Um, and I'll just share a photo um, from this spring um, of a search up in, uh, up on, by Huckleberry, early spring, where I was talking about some of the, the extra pushes that we have with visitation and how folks are doing a lot more um, early season than we've seen in the past. And a gentleman um, came up and went for a hike uh, into the snow, uh, was not prepared and, and got lost. Uh, we did a great, as we'll, I'll talk a little more on the, on the next slide, but cooperators, we were, we were all there, whether it's Border Patrol, whether it's Flathead County, whether it's our Flathead County uh, dogs, um, all working together, um, searching and, and narrowing in. Uh, Two Bear was able to get a night flight in and in the slide, um what you can see here is basically the heat signature and so they're actually able to find him by flying um, at night and be able to find the outline basically of of the individual um in the trees and so just pretty remarkable of what we're able to do it doesn't always work uh, we also find bears this way and find all sorts of other animals when we're looking for other things so it's pretty it's pretty entertaining but using the thermal scan and you can see the rope coming down the rescuer um, and then a gentleman, we were able to come out. Uh, we probably, I mean, it's, it was, it was a rough night. And so that was, again, we were, we were definitely searching. It was, it was a, a great, like, okay, we're, our search was taking us in the right direction. This absolutely got him out faster. Um, and we don't know what would have happened between the time of us finding on the ground, um, and when he was found. So I'm thankful and grateful um, for that, for the program and what we're able to do and work together to get there. But cooperators really in the Northwest are what it's all about. Um, it's pretty amazing. And I've worked throughout the West, as you heard, and I'll say that relationships aren't always this way. And so it's a testament to the, those who are before us uh, coming, but also it's great. I mean, a lot of us are heavily involved in our local communities, not just to the jobs that we do. And so um, so some of us meet across the baseball diamond coaching against our with, our, with, with kids or supporting other groups in the community. And it's something I really, really appreciate about being here. But uh, picture on the top right there is a, a long history here working with Minuteman Aviation, who's now moved more to Missoula, but they used to be based up here in West Glacier. Just a remarkable relationship and the, and the work and that they really did a lot of the work before Two Bear came in, realizing Two Bears on the big scheme of the park is more recent. But of course, alert. Um, <clears throat> Logan Health in the, in the very, various ways, Three Rivers, Border Patrol, uh, Forest Service, North Valley, SAR. Um, Flathead County SAR and then our local VFDs and probably many others um, group that the cooperators that, that we all make it work and depending on the day depending on the need or the resources that we'll grab or put together so that's a huge way where we make it work um, but another piece that we're doing is trying to do things differently and so one of the programs I mentioned is the preventive search and rescue and so a piece of our program where really our aim and our goal um, is although our rescuers love to go rescue people I would rather I would much rather it not ever happen and so it's something that uh, we were doing at the Grand Canyon and recognizing we wanted to stand up more of a program here. I'll say that we've, all of us have been doing preventive search and rescue uh, the way it is. I mean, you think about going to a visitor center, what do they tell you about? It's like, well, make sure you bring water, plan ahead. You think about your talking with friends and if you grew up, maybe it's, whether it's with scouting or whether it's with the Mountaineering Society, of really trying to train ourselves of what are the things and, that we need to do. Uh, to come out, to go safely in the woods and then come back out again. But what we do is PSAR is very similar, a huge educational um, focus. If you've been up on Logan Pass on a, on a hot day, you probably have seen a whiteboard up there where there's a whiteboard often by the trail going on the high line that says, are you really sure you want to be doing this? Do you really have what you need? Trying to get that time and even and having folks up there to talk. Um, and to be chatting through about, is this where you should be doing? And, we'll, and then we'll also pre-position some of those rangers in the right place. And so often we'll have some maybe folks out at, at Granite Park. And I'll, I'll say that today we had a couple of peace rangers at Granite Park, right where they should be. Um, and they were able to affect a, and participate and be right there today to help um, with a with a successful outcome, which is always good to see. So that peace our program, definitely a one that we need to continue um, as, as we look into the future, because I don't see that visitation changing. I see our need for educator uh, continuing, and we do this in many other ways too. So continuing to to add at our visitor centers and recognizing folks there, whether it's the front desk, whether it's at the conservancy, people coming in, it's like literally we're all doing a role of preventive search and rescue, of uh, making sure that people don't get in over their heads. 
The other thing you'll see, and when I, I talk a little bit about social media, is a, a big push from our local tourism boards and otherwise with this the hashtag. And you'll see I, I don't actually have a, a fancy one, but it's a recreate responsibly concept. <laughs> and so some of these things are are out there. But part of what we saw is that part of this was COVID. It was a pretty crazy shift. And I've already talked about a little bit of the shift of visitors. And for me, the, I'm never going to forget it, but pulling out of the uh, – out of West Glacier here, I'm heading home at, at the end of a day and the car ahead of me just rolled down their window and I saw a park map come out the window. I saw the park newspaper come out the window um, of just the lack of the responsibility of, of what we're doing and where we are in terms of respecting and leaving no trace. And so we're like, oh, okay, well, how else can we educate people? Because maybe people just don't know. They might not have grown up with that. So how do we, how do we provide that? And so this Recreate Responsibly is a national effort and one that uh, our local tourism boards have brought up as well um, to know before you go, figure out what's going on. And clearly fire restriction would be a good example of that around here. Um, planning and preparing, seeing if you need permits uh, under reservations, making sure that a place like Glacier, yeah, there's some different hoops you have to jump through because of the numbers that we have. Um, being inclusive, uh, respecting others leave no trace. And so maybe we can help teach people that the leave no trace principles that are better and sustain the places we love. Another piece uh, that, that's really been a good social media push is really the whole with is that connection. Um, so tagging of, of, of locations, uh, you'll see people say that it's like, yeah, I'm not going to tell you exactly where this is. Um, you're going to have to seek it out, but it, isn't this an amazing, beautiful place? Um, and so really encouraging folks to do a little more in terms of diving into the um, trip planning and otherwise. So final piece on here before jumping to a couple others is what we're doing here is <clears throat> looking at our employees. And so if I don't take care of the employees that we have that are doing all these amazing things, but working their tails off, um, it's, it's a steep decline. Uh, and so number one priority for us, um, when we look as a, as a park and, with Dave Romer, our superintendent Romer, um, really bringing together our annual work plan. Our goal one is taking care of our employees and improving the work environment and figuring out how can we make Glacier the best place to work and live. It's Glacier is an amazing place. It connects. I mean, I'll tell you that Saturday was a, an amazing day for me and my son. And it's and I think we we're all here for an amazing reason. Um, search and rescue is one of those things that can be an amazing experience. It can it also can be remarkably traumatic. Um, and things that we carry um, with us. And I'll say as someone who sees a therapist now, and I, I speak that openly and I encourage others to as well, uh, mental health after dealing with a number of these incidents is real. Um, and I've been proud, incredibly proud of my career. I've been incredibly fit, thinking I'm talking to folks and everything else, uh, but it's still, uh, it's still weighs on you and there are ways. So learning and teaching our employees and our new employees of, of how and, and how to process. Um, without question, we are shaped by the experiences and we sign up for it and love the work that we do. Um, but one of our main goals is to, is to help teach our employees what are some other things they can do uh, to take care of themselves and their families, including mental health therapists, uh, to fitness plans, to health and wellness uh, across the board. And so really figuring out what are those things that we can do to take care of employees for their development and continue so that they're here for a long time and continue to love what they do. And then they can get near the end of their career like I am right now and still say that like, man, what what a remarkable career it's been. And I'm pretty proud of the, the work that we've been able to do. Yeah, disappointments, absolutely. Um, but there are also some remarkable achievements, which we're all should be pretty proud about. So with that, I think we're getting close on there because we the goal was some policy. Uh, some complexity of all the things that we do, some of those trends. Um, so we're seeing with the calls, what are those calls for service looking like? What's our staffing look like? And then some of the things that we're doing now into the future. So I know I had a question on this slide, um, but I'm also open to, open to other questions or where do we wanna go? Paul, we do. Do. <laughs> go ahead, Stacey. Go ahead, we do have some questions for you. Okay. 
So let me go ahead and get started. And I think this is kind of a great one because it ties in technology and possibly the new type of visitor. But um, Doug sent in a message and he was saying that he had heard that the new generation of students who've grown up with GPS and Siri on their phones have surprisingly weak spatial awareness compared to previous generations who grew up with paper maps. Are you seeing that possibly reflected in anything you're doing? You say possibly weak spatial awareness? Right. So they're they're looking at, you know, you look at your iPhone or your whatever, and you're just told where to go versus looking at yep. a paper map and being oriented towards that. Yes. Um, I I would say that the understanding of how to to actually to use a paper map is is something that is pretty remarkably challenging. Uh, because yeah, absolutely. Folks are used to looking at their phone, see the direction that they're supposed to go and go, as opposed to where am I? Uh, just basic orientation skills, as I would call them, uh, with a paper map is difficult. Um, that being said, I will also say that, um, and today's example is a good one, is the person, the young young man we were talking to, while his phone was uh, was dying, was able to tell us quickly what the what his coordinates were uh, while talking on the phone, which completely locked us into where he was and be able to coach him through what his next moves were. And so I think my mom would have a very difficult time doing that. Um, and so just thinking about that through of there's some there's some pros there, but there are also some um, I think there's some some challenges with that. Yeah. You want to have fun. Give a kid a map and tell them to figure out where they are. <laughs> OK, this has been <laughs> great. And I will try and get through all these questions. We don't have much time. But if you wanted to share, what was the most re rewarding um, SAR you've had? Hmm. Um, there's a, there's a bunch that are rolling through my head right now. Um, and I think I'm going to lump, I'm going to lump a bunch together and it's because I, I really can't pick, pick one, but it's, it's seen folks have that really positive experience of being able to reunite. Um, there's being able to reunite a family, um, when they thought the worst is out there. Um, cause mine works in, 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 in really difficult ways as we process, but I'll say that just the joy of being able to get a family reunited, um, when all hope was lost and that's, it's, it's amazing, but it also brings up my, the other, the, the, the other heartache, which is the, the opposite, um, uh, when, when it's closure, um, when it's telling a family that their that their son has died, um, and that's incredibly difficult, but a, but a really something that I take a lot of pride in and ownership in making sure that it's done. And if there's not a there is a right way to do it, and it's not an easy way. Um, so, it's, so I think incredibly rewarding. Yes, um, but I can't I can't actually separate at this point in my career. Some of those are really positive ones with with some of those just heartbreaks. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. And you talked a little bit about how you got your start. What kind of training is required? And then also, do you all use volunteers? Yeah, so um, so how I got my start, I think we kind of hit that pretty well, right? And so in terms of um, training required, it, it depends on the discipline. Every discipline has a unique skill set of, of training. So for example, technical rope rescue. Um, you can't just take a class and be a great rescuer. Um, it's got to be, it's something that you practice. And so whether you're a climber, whether you're a rescuer, you, it's something that you actually have to put the time in. Um, put the time in so that you know the pieces. And then there absolutely are standardized, whether it's a three-day class to get you started, then the five-day class, and then a seven-day class. And there are actually accreditations um, across the board for most all these different disciplines, whether it's swift water, whether it's technical rope rescue and search management. And you and then you can get into the snow avalanche is there are trainings for all those. Um, really, when you go through it, if, if I'm realistic about the time uh, that I need our folks to be training, it's about a third of their time should be training all the disciplines to be proficient, which is a really hard way when you think about it. Um, to manage, but to truly be good at what we do, at a third of their time, our time needs to be done training to make sure we're proficient in everything we're trying to do. All right. And do you all have volunteers? 
Uh, we do have some volunteers, but the majority of our volunteers, we work through our cooperators. And so if like Flathead County, um, North Valley, uh, those are that's where we go um, to bring some of those other larger scale groups in um, when we need to go beyond our employees or a specific skill set. Often with some of these skill sets, it's not everyone can come in and do it right. Like a day like today, uh, there aren't a lot of people who I want to be having above tree line. When the winds are going 50, you can see maybe 10 feet um, and it's raining sideways. And so, and then as the, as the weather goes on, it's, so it's, it's, it's vetting those folks um, and then going on. So it's really, the volunteers would come through uh, those different agencies is the primary way. Perfect. And um, this is a question from Eric and Tanya. Do you have an opinion on whether hikers should carry a reco reflector or similar device to facilitate rescue? Yeah. So reco reflectors are often in your, um, a lot of our jackets that are much more popular on the ski hill, for example, anyway. And so, yes, that's, that's, those reflectors can be seen and can be found. Uh, Two bear has the ability to get them. So if it's something that's, that you have access to, yes, um, that's a way to, to, another one of the, one more way uh, just to be picked up. Perfect. When heading into the backcountry day hiker overnights, where would you suggest the best resource to file an itinerary plan? I think this is something to, important to talk about. Should it be with friends, friends or family? Um, is there a dedicated place where someone can do that at MPF or in the park? Awesome. So great topic. And I should have brought that up myself. So I appreciate whoever brought that up, that this is part of trip planning. Um, and it, it's really, it's for going on a trip, um, if it's not work related, um, that would be friends and family. And so friends and family, uh, it really making sure that they understand what your plan is, what's that time, what's your expected time out. And a lot of the extra pieces of like, do you have a communication device? What color is your tent? What color, what type of shoes are you wearing? And so if we're going to be looking for tracks, I need to, we need to have an idea. Are we looking for Luxol Vibram or are we looking for tennis shoes um, in terms of tracks for shoes that are out there or otherwise? And so trip planning, a huge deal, um, but letting people know and having that, what that plan is, is huge. And that's just writing that out, leaving it for somebody. Uh, this is where my car is going to be. Uh, because most of the time what we get is a call that says, hey, my loved one went for a went for a hike in Glacier and they're not here today. And so our first thing we do is we start, we spend time. All, I mean, yes, we have rangers everywhere, but we'll be cruising around uh, with other agencies looking for that said vehicle. And then once we find the vehicle, then we start going from there. But if we don't know where someone's, where even to start, it's truly looking for a needle in a haystack. Thank you. Um, you talked about employee wellness and how important it is. Can you tell us briefly about the evolution of the employee care as you've seen it evolve? Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. Um, so just my, I'll just speak for myself is that. Um, so my first body recovery was when I was 18 years old um, and I got called out um, to go up in the north and in, in the Cascades. So just to buy Snoqualmie Pass on Guy Peak to to carry a, to help carry a body out. And we laughed about it, um, which is black humor. That's help. That's actually okay. As long as you're not around family to, to, to joke about it, laugh about it. And that was it. Um, I'll say once I joined the park service, we continue of, um, we would have something and, and what we, what we'd be, what we hear um, from folks probably in my seat back in those years was take care of yourself, um, which is, nice but we didn't actually we were, we were never provided the tools um, nor the openness of of mental health and then no, nor the openness of saying huh my chief ranger sees a therapist and that's okay in fact that's encouraged um to try to make sure that yeah he's whole at the end of his career um as well as when he goes home um he's balanced and able to focus on his family and so it's growing and, and it's really neat and, and, and uh, Sheriff Hayden O'Brien and I have very similar conversations about what he's trying to do for his his team, uh, because we all are seeing whether it's I know we're talking search and rescue, but law enforcement, some of those pressures on our public safety and the change in public support of our law enforcement officers and uh, uh, and public servants um, is also weighs on our employees. And so in terms of from internally from within the agencies, it's been a remarkable improvement. Um, another group that we didn't have that we have now are peer-to-peer -peer support. And so fellow 
rangers, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's search and rescue, so peer-to-peer -peer support uh, means that uh, someone like myself who's who's trained and gone through additional training can go out and then support other teams who've been through tragedy and it's or just call me and be able to protect by the cops act be able to be able to call me and have a conversation about what might be keeping you up at night uh, because yeah i'd wake up at three in the morning and go for a run and yeah i was in really good shape uh, but I, i'd say i didn't learn the tools necessarily of how to put these in the right places yeah, and um, someone just made a comment is thank you to you and your team, because I think that's something we all feel. And I think just knowing that you have that safety net and Glacier is hugely valuable. And I think this has been very eye opening for all of us. So thank you. A um, couple more questions. I'm going to fire off really quickly. You use the term cooperators. Can you remind us what that is? Yeah, so cooperators in this sense. Um, for search and rescue is all these different, whether it's agencies, uh, partners. And so in this case, it could be the sheriff's department. It could be using two bear air or there's, or their search and rescue units, whether it's their dogs or the volunteer groups <clears throat> it could be alert. It could be Minuteman, could be the border patrol. It's we're all working together for a common good. And that's, and you see it on wild and fire up here as well, that we are all in the room together and it could be other agencies. It could be, uh, BNSF, it could be Flathead Electric Co-op, it could be others that are just trying to figure out how can we all help each other uh, for a common good and a common goal. And okay, and clearly Tyler, the concern. Oh, I forgot the conservancy. Of course, is is a huge cooperator there when we're able to support programs and and what we're able to do. And Carl and Katie, I'm coming your way. You are next. Sorry, I just wanted to re read through all the ones on the screen first. So um, you can go ahead. Let me go ahead and see if I can unmute you. All right, there. you should be unmuted. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Carl, and we have one of the uh, Garmin SOS units. And as part of Garmin, you can get a $50,000 policy to cover expenses, you know, rescue expenses. Do you find in your experience that people who are rescued actually get a bill, like for helicopter expenses and so forth? No, so National Park Service does not charge for search and rescue, period. And so the only time we will go after restitution to pay for anything is if there's full negligence and there's something else going on. And so, for example, it, if you were told four times by uniformed personnel not to do something and you chose to do it anyway, and then we had to come rescue you, um, that's a time where um, our United States attorneys and otherwise might say, it, you know what, you need to pay for this. Um, but for the National Park Service and for Two Bear Air, for example, um, search and rescue is not a is not charged. And I have one more, which I think will be fun. Do you have a typical day? Can you describe it? <laughs> um, the great thing about being a ranger uh, is that every day is different. Um, my son was just uh, had a job making pizzas. Um, and he's like, man, I do the same thing every day. I'm like, well, it's up. If, if you like that, that's great. He's like, no, I don't really like it. It's like, well, come be a ranger. He's like, ooh, no. Uh, but it's everything is always different. Now, for me now, I'm an administrator. And so that's a lot of what my off what my day is and what you see behind me in my office or at meetings or uh, meeting with our teams to make sure they have what they need to succeed. And that's how I really view my my job now is to, to, to really support them and put the right pe people in the right place to do good things. Um, Earlier in my career, I was I used to be more on the sharp end of the rope. And so being able to be, whether it's at the Grand Canyon, and some days you would be SAR shift. And that was what your job was, is you were responsible for any and every search and rescue that happened in Grand Canyon. And so when you got a, a, a call from a river trip that someone had flipped and had an injury, you had coordinate to get them out. Uh, if you had a, a hiker coming out in the heat and having issues, you'd coordinate that at the same time um, or whatever it might be. So it's one of the great, I just, yeah, I've loved what I've done over my career and in, in terms of every day is absolutely different, uh, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's search and rescue, EMS, wild and fire, helicopter work, and yeah, administrative work and planning as well. Thank you. And Amy, I will turn it back to you. Paul, I just have to say it's it's sort of mind boggling the scope of, of what you do um, and the different 
as you said, disciplines that you have to have and number of people in, in the area that you cover. So this was uh, super fascinating. I feel like we have a few uh, loose ends to tie up. One was the picture that you brought up at the very beginning. Oh, that's right. And yep. um, I think we were asking folks if they knew where it was. Um, does yep. anybody want to unmute and take a guess or put it in the chat? Well, we're either shy or we don't know. Andrew says Jackson. Well done. Yep. So Mount Jackson, uh, Jack, my son and I went for a went for a little wander on Saturday. Um, and so went from the trailhead to go up Mount Jackson and we got a later start than we were planning. And so there might have been a thing I call the Congo line at 545 coming through this um coming through the park and we didn't get to the trailhead until about 7 15 and we had a turnaround time set and so talking about planning not only do people know where we're going uh but when you're climbing in the mountains and otherwise it's good to have a turnaround time and a plan of how to get back um and so we reached our turnaround time and we were not at the summit and so we assessed kind of where we were and how we felt what we had with us um it was cold on saturday up high um, down low it might have been warm but up high it was whipping with wind um and yeah i think we'd had about a 5000 foot elevation climb up to that point and so we were a little a little tuckered and it was a pretty cool conversation but also a pretty cool turnaround to say that summit's going to be there is like do you, like we can make it but it means we're not going to get out till 10 11 o'clock at night um and um we said you know what yeah let's turn around and uh, a pretty cool experience to help teach. And that's one of the, the points is, is making sure that we're teaching this next generation of folks and users of have of summit fever uh, versus making the right decisions. We can come back uh, and live to climb another day as someone just put in the chat there. And that's the, that's the joy of it. And it's still, I mean, it's the experience. I mean, of being out there and, and sharing that experience and what an amazing place this place is. So good job, Anders. Yeah, great job, Andrew, and great job, Paul and Jack, for making the right decision and turning <laughs> around and Thank a you. good lesson yeah. for everybody. Uh, we typically do a giveaway on these. And Stacy, I don't know if you have names, but we have we have um fun conservancy luggage tags, um, two of them to give away. Yes, and I do have lucky winners. We have Roberta Struck and Jonathan of Church. So we will. Um, follow up with you but if you wouldn't mind also just messaging me your email that'll be great so we can make sure we have the right contact information so that's Roberta Struck and Don Jonathan Upchurch. So Paul thank you again for all this information and for educating us and for the job that you've done um, for Glacier. Thank you to all of our donors who support our programs including um, wellness of search and rescue and other things. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, September 20th is book club and the next Glacier Conversation will be on October 18th where we will highlight some of our 2024 projects. Um, thank you um, everybody, um, but especially Paul and um, good luck on the search, search that is ongoing at this point. Appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Have a great night.